the World War I military jetty at Southampton disappeared from view when the new western docks were built, and with it the contribution made to the war effort, including the transportation of the first tanks to the front line in France. Great Britain entered World War I on the 4th of August 1914, and by the end of the month the railway had transported almost 120,000 servicemen to Southampton, where they would board boats to France. The first train carrying members of the original expeditionary force left Waterloo Station on the morning of Sunday the 10th of August. Over the next three weeks, a train full of troops would reach the docks every 12 minutes in a 14-hour day. Begun in 1917, there was at the time both a serious shortage of shipping and great congestion at the ports, particularly on the French side, which delayed the turnaround of the ships employed on this traffic. An appreciable portion of the traffic consisted of locomotive wagons, ambulance coaches, tanks, heavy ordnance, motor transport and other bulky material, equally inconvenient to stow occupying an undue amount of space in the holds of vessels, requiring much manpower, crane power and time to load and unload and frequently necessitating the dismantling and subsequent re-erection of the machinery. The first reason for establishing the ferry service was therefore to relieve the shipping of this class of traffic. The second was to provide the ferry steamers with their own berths without taking up any of the already overtaxed existing key space. Thirdly, to effect a valuable saving of handling at the time when manpower was of vital importance and crane power a serious consideration, and fourthly, to afford means of meeting urgent demands for any special war material, such as guns or ammunition, by delivery in case of possible emergency, straight from the factory to the theatre of war by rail, without any transshipment, when time might mean everything. Of course, one such special wartime requirement was the tank, Although they were notoriously unreliable, they were fearsome enough for Allied commanders to request a thousand more. On the decision by the War Cabinet early in January 1917 that the cross-channel barge service already in operation from Richborough on the southeast coast should be supplemented by a train ferry, it was thought expedient to establish a second train ferry at a port on the south coast so that if in any emergency Richborough regarded as the northern route should no longer be available, an alternative southern route should still be made use of. The choice of a port for the southern route was not made without a certain degree of consideration. Portsmouth, the River Hamble, Langston Harbour, Chichester and Keyhaven were all passed under review, but the decision eventually arrived at was in favour of Southampton. Here a suitable site for a train ferry jetty and one offering many natural advantages was found on the western shore, immediately west of the Royal Pier. The position was sheltered, there was good access from the sea, very little dredging was required, ample space was available for manoeuvring the train ferries in and out of a berth, provided at the end of a jetty stretching out from a stone embankment on shore. No interference with existing traffic arrangements would be involved, a marshalling yard capable of holding about 500 wagons and communicating with eight berthing sidings equal to another 200 wagons could be readily laid out on reclaimed land along the foreshore, while connection between the jetty and the London and South Western lines could be established by a new railway about one mile in length, leaving the main line of that system at Southampton West Station and continuing to the end of the jetty where the loaded trades would pass direct onto the ferry boat awaiting them in the berth. Such was the plan adopted for the South Coast Terminal and in the result it operated with complete success. The berth was accessible at all states of the tide which here has a range of 13 feet. Variations in level were readily overcome by the provision at the end of the jetty of an adjustable bridge 120 feet long with a vertical range of 12 feet across which the railway wagons would pass direct on the train ferry steamer. This arrangement was practically identical with the system adopted at Richborough. 
the only difference being that the bridge at Southampton was somewhat longer to suit local conditions. Dieppe, 130 miles distant, was selected as the terminal on the French coast for its Southampton route, denoting to the fact that it offered the advantage of more suitable railway connections than were available elsewhere. In the first instance, the train ferry steamer used at Southampton was similar to the two employed at the Richborough service. It was a steamer of this capacity that a start was made on February the 22nd, 1918. The passage between Southampton and Dieppe made three times a week in each direction and on alternate days at hours dependent on the state of the tide. Great advantages in the dispatch of war material to the Western Front were secured. But in June 1918, the whole situation had to be reconsidered owing to the gravity of the military situation. The possibility of the channel ports being captured by the enemy was recognised, and among other measures taken as a matter of prudence in the event of such a contingency actually arising was that of providing for the evacuation of Richborough. But the mere transfer to Southampton of the ferry steamers which had been running from Richborough would not, it was felt, suffice in itself under the conditions that might now arise. Action had already been taken, creating a large fleet of a thousand ton cross-channel barges, which were to proceed no farther than the ports on the French coast. But Richborough, whatever the military situation, would not be able to accommodate all these vessels. So it was decided that the town quay at Southampton and also Poole Harbour should be utilised as places from which war material could be sent overseas by barge service. In the case of Southampton, this barge service would supplement the train ferry, just as in the case of Richborough, whilst the town quay at Southampton and the harbour at Paul would be still more useful if the emergency that might be brought about did actually occur. These proposals were carried out at the earliest possible moment as regards the town pier at Southampton where a barge service was begun in July 1918. On November the 6th, 1918, and only a few days therefore before the signing of the armistice, another train ferry service, one between Southampton and Sherville, was begun with a fourth steamer, which differed essentially from the three already in operation. The Leonard, as the vessel was called, had three lengths of track, giving accommodation for 39 10-ton wagons, representing a total load of 550 tons, while the train deck could be lifted bodily to a height of 18 feet by means of hydraulic gear, and on account of differences in size and construction, special berths were provided for the Leonard, alike at Southampton and at Sherbourg, to which route the vessel was restricted.